Thanks for tuning in to this message. My name is Jared Piney. I'm the online pastor here at Pathway, and I'm here with one of our worship directors and online hosts, Maddie Seitz. We hope this message is a valuable resource to you and helps you grow deeper in your faith. If you consider yourself a Christian and this message blesses you, I hope you'd consider giving back to us at Pathway so we can continue connecting all people to Jesus and helping them become his fully devoted followers. Learn more at pathwaychurch.com forward slash giving. And if you decide to take a step in your faith after the message today, simply visit pathwaychurch.com forward slash next so we can help provide you with resources and partner with you in this journey. Hi, my name is Todd Carter and I want to personally welcome you to Easter at Pathway. And I'm at a mausoleum right now. And I used to have a friend that would say to me frequently, the strange thing about life is none of us are going to get out of here alive. And the truth is, places like this and others like it have become way too familiar in this last year. I've performed and been to more funerals in the last year than I have in my whole life. You see, because of this pandemic that we've been living through, we've had to face death and the possibility of death in a way that we've never had to before. But the interesting thing about the Easter story is that it starts 
with Jesus' death, Jesus was crucified. And crucified is actually where we get the word excruciating from. Because being crucified is the worst possible way of death known to man. You know, I've had so many people in this last year tell me that this has been the worst year of their lives. And it's been the worst year of their lives, not just because of the loss of life, but rather because of the death that's been going on inside of them. For some of us, it's been an emotional death. It's come in the form of depression. For others of us, it's been dealing with a financial death because of a job loss or a bankruptcy. And for others of us still, it's been dealing with a relational death. We've been through a divorce or some other kind of broken relationship. I know for me in this past year, I felt death during the shutdown. And all I could feel was just this dark future that was looming in front of us. The reality is death is everywhere. And we truly can't understand the power of hope this Easter until we face the darkness of death. Now, God isn't a fan of death, but he does tell us about death. He says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, no one has power over the day of death. Now, some people believe that this verse seems to indicate that there is no control in our lives over when we die. When our day is up, it's up. And I'm not exactly sure that that's the meaning of this verse, but I do know for sure that the scripture teaches us that death is a reality. And absent from God, death rules over your life and over mine. Growing up, I struggled with my mental health a lot, and I was really good at hiding it. When everyone else saw me, they saw someone that was good at sports, someone that was good at um, academics and had it all together, but on the inside, like, that was not the case. I placed my identity in sports and in a single second, that was gone. I had an injury that ended my college career and everything I was, everything that everyone knew me as was an athlete and that was gone. So I instantly spiraled into a really dark place and got to a point where I ended up in a mental health hospital and had a plan to end my life. My father always kind of had some problems with alcohol and stuff, but it really came to a head because his addiction kind of spiked a little bit. My mom became addicted to some things and I didn't really know how to take it because I always was very close with my parents and I noticed that a lot of stuff was going on that just wasn't right. One of the darkest things I have in my life that I struggled with for a long time, since I was basically, I would say, a child, because I saw it when I was very young and I thought it was okay, it was pornography. I spent a lot of time looking for the validation, the acceptance from other people, my peers, my family, my coworkers. Everything I did, I was doing it for them. I wanted them to make me feel special and I felt when I did something good for them it would make me have that validation that I didn't have and that I didn't need and I was looking for that acceptance and I never fully got fulfilled with that validation or that acceptance that I was looking for because I mean they just couldn't do it for me. In my darkest point or my lowest point I had like shut everybody out. I cried all the time, I wasn't happy Things that normally should make me happy, I didn't find any joy in. It was just like I was going through the motions. I got up, I went to work, I came home, I was mommy, did my mommy duties, went to bed. Like nothing felt enjoyable to me. And it was just like I was just in the cycle of just, just doing. But I never truly felt joy in anything and it was just like, I was just there. I was just like a shell of myself. Spent about 20 years of my, my, my life being a meth addict. I've just destroyed my own life. Kids didn't even want to talk to me because I was that type of person, just 
mean, vulgar. I was living in an RV, which I still do, but I was a drug addict, and they were living in the house with my wife, and I was living in the RV, and I knew I needed to quit drugs, so I packed my stuff, and I went to Lake Afton. Broke my heart, but that's the lowest I've ever felt in my life. You know, talk about feeling dead is when you want to be dead. When you think of death, it brings to mind a place like this, a crematory. And before a person goes to a mausoleum, this is the kind of place where they bring the body. It's a place of death. It's a dark place. And today, many of us find ourselves in a similar place, entombed in circumstances in our lives that we feel like we can't get out of or dead in the choices that we've made. And that's exactly where the disciples found themselves that very first Easter. But a short time after Jesus was crucified and placed in that tomb, the disciples and other followers go to see him. And what they found when they got there was shocking. Instead of finding a body that they could dress and pay homage to, they instead found an empty tomb where Jesus' body used to be. And Jesus talked uh, about the fact that he would rise from the dead. But the disciples didn't understand or fully believe what he was talking about. But there was an angel there that day at the empty tomb. And the angel says to Jesus' followers, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen. And in that moment, is where the unexpected met reality, where the greatest despair became the greatest hope. You see, the thing I love about Easter is that it's based in real hope. It's historical, it's physical, it actually took place. And I know there may be many of you who might be thinking to yourself, how can you say that? How can you believe that somebody raised from the dead? Well, the reason I say that is because many people have said already that if you would try the case of the resurrection in a court of law, you would win every time because it's an incredibly strong case. And the first reason it's an incredibly strong case is because of women witnesses. Now today we don't have the greatest of male and female relationships, but back in the first century, it was awful. Women weren't actually allowed to even give testimony in a court of law. So if you were trying to concoct a lie back in the first century, you wouldn't have used women witnesses. And the point being now, the testimony of women witnesses actually gives great historical credibility to the fact that the account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ actually took place. And what makes the case of the resurrection strong as well is not just the testimony of women witnesses, but it's also the historical evidence on top of that. For example, there are over 515 eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Think about that from a legal standpoint. If any legal case would have 515 eyewitnesses telling the same story, it'd be an open and shut case. Some people though might want to dismiss the historical evidence that's found in the Bible for the resurrection but there are actually 39 ancient sources for the life of Jesus Christ outside of the Bible, including 17 from non-Christian sources. Together, these sources report 110 different facts about the life of Jesus, his miracles, his teaching, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. So today, even if you dismiss the Bible as an authoritative historical document, there are 39 other sources outside of the Bible that document the same event. But honestly, what I think is the most compelling evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the number of Jesus' closest followers who died for their faith rather than denying the resurrection. 
People like Matthew, Mark, Luke, Peter, Thomas, James, all of them were willing to be killed rather than to say that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a lie. You see, people are willing to die for something they believe in that's true, but no one is willing to die for something they know is a lie. And the disciples didn't just believe that Jesus came back from the dead, they knew it to be true and they ultimately died for it. You see, the good news of Easter is because Jesus conquered death, life is possible for all of us. I'm at an incredible place right now. All kinds of stuff growing up around me everywhere. And everything here today came from a seed, a seed that fell to the ground and died. And from that death sprang forth new life. You know, every spring I love watching the daffodils, just like these ones uh, behind me that are on the east side of my house where they grow up and they push through the nearly frozen earth into a landscape that pretty much still looks like it's committed to winter. And those flowers, they just stand up tall and they announce that spring is here and that winter is over. And to me, that's a great picture of the resurrection. The resurrection is the moment when the grace of God pushed into our dark world and announced new life, new hope, and new possibilities, that death was defeated. And that's such good news because that can happen in your life and in my life today. You see, on that very first Easter morning, life defeated death and winter was over. Death brought life. Jesus himself said, you save your life by losing it. When we die to ourselves and lose our lives to Jesus and his direction, we find life. But what's that really look like when we die to ourselves and lose our lives for Jesus and his direction? At one point, I was in a gazebo all by myself at night and having suicidal ideation and that kind of stuff and just cried out to God, like, I don't want to keep living like this. I just, I just can't. And so I looked up to the sky and closed my eyes and was just sitting there, just broken. And when I closed my eyes, I felt like someone was holding me. I know that it was God, it was God. He was holding me there. He was there reassuring me that I've got you, it's okay. It's okay to be broken. One of the favorite verses that I have is in First Peter where it talks about this inexpressible joy that you have as an end result of your faith. And I now know that and experience that. So when I realized what my purpose was, it gave me life and joy, and I now know that I have a future, and my mission is to give people purpose because I found mine, and so I want others to have that as well. 
I used to work for my uncle and we had patients in there and there was just one particular patient that would talk about this with me. She put me on the spot one day. She said, Brian, if someone walked in here and put a gun to your head and said, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, yes or no? What would you say? And I sat there for a second and I was like, yes. And then I like was like, why did I say that? And really that one step of her pushing me I went on this journey of research, you know, reading the Bible, uh, watching YouTube videos, watching debates between Christians and atheists, watching or listening to podcasts. As I went on, the pieces started just kind of, kind of coming together. I realized how incredible it was that he, that God sacrificed Himself for us when He didn't have to do it. You know, He gave us these bodies, this life. And, and it's incredible. Once I started coming to the church, I felt compelled by something that I can't explain that I needed to serve in the church. I needed to start giving more. I needed to be involved, you know, and when I'm asked to do opportunities, I take them. The gospel is freedom from death. That's what it is. It's freedom from sin. And you know that you'll be serving the best thing that there ever was and is. Jesus has rescued me because I feel like he saved my life. I met Jessica, my coworker, and she kept telling me, come to Pathway, come to Pathway, it's right down the street from you. And I was like, oh, all right, fine. And to have her walk beside me, and then just to kind of see how my life is changing, like even in my lowest points, because I've still had some very difficult challenges along the way, some of my friends will be like, how are you surviving? Like, how are you not breaking down? Like, how are you not in a mental hospital right now? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, I'm just doing it. After reflecting, I'm like, well, because I've let go of control of things and I've put it in God's hands. And I know ultimately He's gonna get me through what I'm going through. And I can't keep fighting Him and I can't keep fighting His plan for me. I've gotta just let go and let Him be in charge of my life. And it's been, one of the most freeing experiences, how freeing it is just to be like, all right, I don't have to do this on my own. I didn't have nothing no more, you know? And I met Josh, I met Chris, and they brought me here to Pathways. It's just being sober, you know, and, and finding God. It's what else would you really need other than, other than those two things there to, to change your life? I've been baptized before, and there's just, God wasn't there. December 13, 2020, he was here. Yeah, I'm telling you, he was. I come up out of the water and I screamed. Talk about being alive, there it is again, you know. It'll raise the hairs on your arms. A lot of people have seen the change in my life, and it just makes me smile, you know. It really does, because I've tried so many times in life my own way. It's not my way no more. It's his, and it's, it's really chokes you up. You see, dying to yourself and surrendering your life to Jesus leads to life. That's the invitation of Easter. The invitation of Easter is that we don't have to lay dead and dying in the tomb any longer. We can be made alive. And that's what happened in these people's lives. And that's what Jesus wants to do in your life today. So today, if you're dead in your addiction, Jesus wants to make you alive. If you're dead in your marriage, Jesus wants to bring it back to life. Or if you're fearful of the future, Jesus wants to give you a new hope today. That's what Easter does. Jesus takes dead and broken things in our lives and he brings them back to life. So how does a person embrace then this new life that's found in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus says in John 5, 24, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He is crossed over from death to life. And then Jesus goes on to say in Revelation chapter 3, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. 
The way you cross over from death to life is by believing in Jesus and opening up the door of your life to him and allowing him to direct you in the way you should go. Because otherwise we keep doing the same old things that have been entombing our lives in the first place. So I really want to encourage you this Easter to cross over from death to life, to open up the door of your life to Jesus and let him in because he wants to make you alive again. Well, right now, I just wanna invite you just wherever you're watching right now, just to be able to bow your head and close your eyes with me. And I just wanna spend a little bit of time right now just talking to God in prayer. And as we begin to pray today, I wanna to let you know, Jesus is here. He's here with us right now. And he wants you to experience his freedom, his peace, his power. He wants you to experience a new kind of life. So I don't want you to miss this moment, to be able to make this Easter your Easter, to open up the door of your life to Jesus, to make Jesus the leader and the savior of your life. So don't miss this moment. Pray this prayer with me right now. Oh Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, that I've made mistakes. But today, Jesus, I open up my heart to you and I make you the leader and the savior of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. And now use my life, Jesus, to go and offer your life and your hope to other people. And it's in your name, Jesus, that I pray. Amen.